Hello friends, um, thank you so much for having me. So today I'm going to talk about Urkel. In particular, I'm going to dig into some of the core values and standout features. So a quick intro just on me. Uh, so my name is Caddy. I'm currently an engineering manager at Formidable, where I'm spending most of my time building mobile apps, both in React Native and GraphQL. I've been partial to GraphQL even from before I started using React Native, uh, but having used both REST and GraphQL in mobile applications, I can definitely see how many of the benefits of GraphQL can be particularly useful for mobile. And I really hope that one day GraphQL will be the standard for native applications. So why am I here talking about Urkel? Well, Urkel is a GraphQL client for React, React Native, and others. And it's an open source project built by Formidable. And that's the company I work for. At Formidable, we invest a lot in open source. We're all standing on the shoulders of giants here. And um, I mean, this very conference wouldn't even exist if Facebook hadn't decided to open source GraphQL in the first place. At Formidable, we have various initiatives to encourage folks to contribute to open source, both within Formidable source, but also to personal and community projects. Urkel is one of the many open source projects we've had over the years, but currently I think it's the most exciting one. Originally, it was created by Ken, then rewritten by Phil, and now with contributions from the community, as well as many of my formidable colleagues. Even I myself have, not, not long ago, uh, contributed by adding an auth exchange for handling authentication and token exchange, but more on that later. <clears throat> so with that in mind, should you use Urkel? Well, there are several other GraphQL clients out there, Apollo Client and Relay in particular. So ultimately, the choice on what GraphQL client to use and or not to use should really depend on the features that you need on your project. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to go through some of the features of Urkel that I think are especially cool and just talk a bit about the general philosophy and the thought process that has gone into designing them. All right, one of the things that really stands out in Urkel compared to others is the commitment to first party support for framework bindings. So outside of React, Urkel has first, first party built-in support for Next.js, Preact, Svelte, and Vue. Although I will say there are no plans on adding bindings to Angular, so if that's your jam, uh, you might have to look elsewhere. Apollo Client and Relay, um, don't actually provide any kind of first party support for, for any framework bindings outside of React, and they rely fully on third party libraries. This is completely fine. Those libraries were designed for React after all, and it's the community that wanted to use them for other frameworks. However, this can have detrimental ripple effects. For example, when the library implements new features or breaking changes and upgrades, all these take time to propagate into the third party libraries. Whereas if you have first party support, these uh, changes are built into uh, the bindings from day one. If you're interested in a more detailed comparison of these libraries, there is a whole section on the Urkel docs where you can find a pretty honest feature comparison between Urkel, Apollo Client, and Relay. However, for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to focus on Urkel only. So if there's one thing we know when it comes to tech is that things change fast and all the time. New language features come, libraries, conventions, the things that are cool change, and even business requirements crop up all the time. When creating Urkel, one of the goals was to make sure that it's as flexible as possible, so it would be able to adapt to the changing tech landscape. So in order to make Urkel as adaptable as possible, it's built to be as extensible as possible. Extensibility really is at the heart of Urkel, which brings us to exchanges. Urkel is built on exchanges. So if you have a think about what a GraphQL client does at its core, it takes a request, a query or a mutation, and it gives the appropriate response. So a cache hit, a response from the API, or an error. So as a result, most GraphQL clients, including Urkel, are built to be stream-based. 
So an exchange is just a plugin that allows you to inspect and modify both the incoming and outgoing streams. Let me show you this by example, because that will make it a whole lot clearer. Well, so when you install Urkel and execute a query, by default, Urkel uses three exchanges. These come packaged into Urkel Core. So we have the dedupe, the cache, and the fetch exchanges. All of these are completely replaceable, by the way, so you could swap out any of these for a custom or an alternate implementation. So first, the dedupe exchange, it removes duplicate requests when the exact request is already in flight. So imagine a website with a header and a sidebar, and both of these want to display the user's name. Both of these will use a use query with exactly the same query. So what the fetch exchange, so the dedupe exchange does, is it makes sure that only one instance of that query is passed on to the next exchange, and therefore um, removing the need for a duplicate API request. Then the cache exchange returns the data from a cache, if there is some. And finally, the fetch exchange, which should always be in the last exchange in the array, uh, does the actual network request and puts the result back into the output stream. Then the result is passed from the network request exchange to the cache exchange, where it is uh, stored for next time. And finally, it's passed back to the use query result. Now, since you can literally add an unlimited amount of plugins, the only way to guarantee that they're all playing nice with each other is to make sure each plugin remains unopinionated. Let's have a look at an actual example of this in exchanges. So first, we have the fetch exchange that we already talked about. This is the default fetch exchange included in Urkel Core. It fetches the data from the API and adds it to the output stream. Now, a separate package add-on um, can, you can install a separate uh, add-on package for automatic persisted queries in Urkel in a persisted fetch exchange. So this exchange uses the same fetch logic as the actual fetch exchange, um, but with automatic persisted queries, basically the way it works is that it allows server-side caching of GraphQL data. So the server can cache the request based on a SHA of its, um, the whole request um, from the client side. And then on the client, we can ask the server a particular request just based on the SHA. And if the server had already had a request exactly with that SHA, it can um, return the re response from the cache at the server side cache. Otherwise, it will say, oh, I don't know anything about this. Please give me more info, in which case we can actually do the query. Now, the persisted fetch exchange should be placed before the actual fetch exchange because firstly, mutations aren't cache and therefore um, they can't be passed on, uh, they need to be passed on to the fetch exchange to handle. And secondly, if the server doesn't support automated persisted queries, in which case the request again will have to be passed to the fetch exchange. A different example, if you wanted to enable file uploads, you could, uh, via multi-part form data and post requests, you can use the multi-part fetch exchange. This exchange used the same fetch logic as the fetch exchange, uh, but it's a drop-in replacement for the default fetch exchange. It will add exactly like the fetch exchange unless the variables it receives for a mutation contain any files. And lastly, as you might have guessed, you can also combine the two exchanges in a persisted multi-part fetch exchange that will support both automated persisted queries and file uploads. In general, Urkel aims for a batteries included approach, meaning that it's like a one-stop shop for everything you need from your GraphQL client. Thankfully, because of the fundamental architecture choice of relying on unopinionated exchanges, every new feature or enhancement can be plug and play with the appropriate exchange. Now, we've already had a look at the fetch exchanges, but let's have a glimpse at a couple more. One handy exchange is the retry exchange, which allows you to automatically retry requests. You can configure a delay, which can be a fixed value of seconds or a random value, and the maximum number of retries. And one close to my heart is the auth exchange. So authentication in GraphQL has been my pet peeve since forever. I've had to implement it several times and it's always been painful. 
there's actually an, an additional difficulty with React Native compared to the web because the um, token storage is asynchronous, which needs to be accounted for when fetching the initial auth state. So with the auth exchange, uh, my goal was to make it extensible so that it could be used for both React Native and for web and for the different implementations of auth. So it supports both React and React Native. That is, you can fetch the token asynchronously or synchronously. It supports token refresh, and both as a mutation and as a separate fetch endpoint. You can set your auth header to whatever way auth works on your application. So sometimes you have a bearer token, or sometimes just a token, or maybe some additional headers. And finally, you'll be able to determine what constitutes as an auth error in your API and log out or handle that as needed. So some APIs use still use HTTP error codes for auth errors, and some APIs use uh, auth codes, and those can be configured in a variety of ways. So the auth exchange supports various implementations on the server side. Regarding DevTools, now, I won't go very deep, deeply into DevTools, but suffice it to say, Urkel has DevTools. And surprise, surprise, you can install them as an exchange. Uh, this is available as a Chrome or Firefox extension or as an Electron app. With the DevTools, you can inspect the queries, results, timelines, and also execute requests directly from the DevTools, which can be really handy because it will use all the exchanges that you have configured locally. All right, time to talk about caching. By default, Urkel uses document caching. It will avoid sending the same request to the GraphQL API repeatedly by caching the result for each query. This basically works the same way as a cache does in the browser. So Urkel creates a key for each request that is set based on the query and its variables. Once a result comes in, it's cached indefinitely by its key. This means that each unique request can have exactly one cached result. However, when we cache queries, we also need to invalidate the cache results when needed. So with document caching, we assume that a result may be invalidated by a mutation that executes on data that has been queried previously. Cache valid invalidation is done only via the type name property. So when we send a mutation that contains types that another query's results contains as well, that query result is removed from the cache. And this brings us to the alternate caching option for Urkel, normalized caching. Document cache is straightforward and effective, but it has some limitations. So before we go into normalized caching, let's have a look at why it was necessary and what are the limitations for document cache. Firstly, as your application grows, it starts duplicating a lot of data. Consider, for example, a paginated list with filter parameters. Because the cache is keyed by the query and the parameters, you'll end up storing the same items multiple times. With document cache, because we only use the type name for data invalidation and not any kind of ID, there's no way to actually automatically reconcile the data. And this leads us to number three, which is that if your application has any mutations, you won't be able to have offline support with document cache. The normalized caching solution for Urkel is called Graph Cache, and it's designed to solve these hard problems. Remember the whole extensibility from earlier, exchanges being unopinionated and replaceable? Well, Graph Cache is a drop in replacement for the default document cache. I'm not going to talk very deeply about Graph Cache, but I'm going to mention the four kind of main features, uh, well, some interesting features from when it comes to Graph Cache. Firstly, obviously we've got optimistic updates, but the unique thing about how GraphCache does optimistic updates is that the, it never actually touches the real data. It always creates a layer on top of your existing data. When the query succeeds, it actually executes the, your custom updater on the real data. So while we have the source of truth from the server, the, your real data is unmodified. I know that other cache solutions tend to um, like create a mock record with a mock ID and then replace it early, replace it later. So GraphCache does none of that. 
Secondly, we've got schema awareness. This means that we fetch the introspection query and um, so we can make the cache aware of it. Then you can be warned when you're doing something wrong. For example, if you're using the wrong type of condition as a query, invalid fragments, querying, unqueryable fields, things like that. And then uh, given that the cache is aware of your schema, it can also serve your partial data. So a good example of this is, for example, a e-commerce site. So on an e-commerce site, you have a list of products. And in order to display this list, you would usually query, you know, just the image, name, maybe the price. Whereas if you go into the product detail page of that product, you will have all kinds of details around sizing, materials, etc. So with partial data, when you go from a product list to a product detail page of a product, we can actually return the data that we already have in the cache. So you can start, the, you can display the image name and the price straight away <clears throat> without waiting for the product query to return with all the details. And finally, and this is actually really important, commutativity. This is the driving force for being able to uh, do offline first. Ensuring that queries are applied in the cache in the order that they are executed. So for example, if you do th three queries in order, there's actually no guarantee that they come back from the server in that order. So if the second query gets returned first, what GraphCache does is, is that it actually applies it the same way as an optimistic update on top of your cache. Then finally, when the first query comes back, they will get applied in order. So with GraphCache, we can build offline first apps, and that is amazing. For me personally, I find it especially powerful for mobile applications where users expect a level of functionality even when they're not connected to the internet. With schema awareness, optimistic updates, and community Commutativity, GraphCache is built to handle offline support effectively. And finally, what about bundle size? Well, often the first thing that comes up when talking about Urkel is how small it is compared to alternatives. And well, yes, the bundle size is small and there are numbers for it. But rather than actually focusing on the numbers, it might be important to focus on why effort was put into reducing the bundle size. Ultimately, the smaller the bundle size, the shorter the parsing times. GraphCache also has a low memory pressure impact and is fast on slow devices. We want to ensure that users in countries and areas around the world with slower internet connection will still get the best possible experience on the web. This leads to a fast and inclusive web. That's all for me. I really hope that you found this insight into Urkel valuable. If you want to know more, I'm going to leave you with two main resources. Firstly, obviously, we've got the official documentation. It's really thorough. You'll be able to find additional information and uh, on all the topics I covered here today. But more importantly, we've got the Urkel community, which lives in the discussion tab on GitHub. I would honestly say this is one of the huge selling points of Urkel. The core maintainers make keeping eye on it a priority and all the discussions are responded to. And you can ask pretty much about anything regarding Urkel from implementation issues of to feature requests or even ask for elaboration on the ethos around the library itself. Thank you very much.